First Kings chapter number 17, I appreciate your prayers this week. It's been a busy week, had a lot going on. I uh, had a couple of funerals this week, and I appreciate you praying on our behalf. And the Lord helped us, and I tell you, all we we done, we tried to sow some seeds this week of the Word of God, and I realize that God's Word will not return void. And I just pray there's a lot of folks come in contact this week that needed the Lord. And uh, so let's just pray that God will just, and His Word will be seasoned with the Holy Spirit, and God will be able to work and change lives. I'm glad He's able to, and I've got all the confidence and trust in Him because He's able to do that that we cannot do. And uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, while you're turning there, I'll tell you about a uh, pretty pretty eye-opening experience this week. Uh, Wednesday night, I, of course, I was heading down to my, my Aunt Martha's house right after the service here on Wednesday night. And uh, Christy, she said she tried to warn me, but I didn't have a missed call on my phone. But anyhow, I left the church, and I was one of the last ones to leave. And I uh, went through East Bend. It's probably, I don't know, I guess about quarter till nine. And by the time I went around that corner right there before we get to East Bend School, I seen him sitting there, but it was too late. And uh, what happened was there's a trooper sitting there. And, of course, I come around that curve, and I was going 10 miles over the speed limit. So, of all places, he decided to pull me right in front of Reese's, and I figured... <laughs> I tried to park way back toward the other side where nobody could see me. But he come up to the window and he said, uh, what are you in such a hurry for? And I said, well, I didn't realize I was in that big of a hurry. And so I gave him my license and my, my registration, told him I was a pastor down here at Faith Community Baptist Church, told him I was going to my uncle's who just passed away. And I thought while he went back to the car, I thought, boy, I bet he's like, I bet he's lying to me. And uh, anyhow, I sit with great anticipation for it seemed like two or three minutes. And he come back up to the window, and he handed my license registration back. And he said, what's your speed when you go through town? And uh, he said, have a good night. And uh, I say that to say this, that man extended grace to me. Because I had broken the law, and I deserved to get a ticket. But that's where grace stepped in. Unmerited favor, and I didn't deserve it. And you say, preacher, why is that important? Well, that's exactly what God done for us. And a God intervened. We had broken the laws of God, and every one of us, the Bible said, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But I'm glad for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm thankful for the salvation. I'm thankful for that amazing grace. Again, none of us deserve it, but I'm glad the Lord so extended His hand of grace to us. First Kings chapter 17, if you found your place, those that can and will, if you're able to, I'd ask if you would to stand with us in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. The last couple of times we've been together, been looking at Elijah, the ministry that the Lord was using him, and basically God was educating him in the first few verses of chapter 17, and I may go back and, and give you just a little bit of background on that, but we're going to begin reading in verse number 17. This particular time, he's found himself in the, the place where in Zarephath, which was the headquarters of Baal worship, and I may deal with that some as we move forward as well. But here God had commanded a widow woman to sustain Elijah and to further the ministry as to what God wanted him to do. Now in verse number 17, we find him in the widow's house with her son, and we find in verse 17 some things that happened. It said, And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Now don't look too far into that. This boy was dead. A lot of folks say, well, he, just, he was just knocked out. No, he was dead. There wasn't any breath in him at all. Look at verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Verse 20 said, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, 
and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the reading of the Word of God. I thank you, Lord, again, that it's holy and undefiled and without error. God, I'm thankful, Lord, that it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And, Father, I pray for the next few minutes, God, I pray that you touch your servant again. I stand where no man can stand alone. I can't do anything without your help. And I pray that you'd come, give us power from above, give us that unction that we desperately need. I pray for that special anointing. I pray for every person, God, that's under the sound of our voice today. God, I don't know everybody's heart. They came in this building today, but, God, I know you do. I pray for those that have got burdens on their heart today. Pray, Lord, that they'd be lifted. But God, above all, there's one that came in the assembly today that's never been saved. And Lord, they don't know the free part in forgiveness of sin. God, may today be that good day of salvation. I know that you're able. And Lord, we know that it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I pray that you'd be in the midst. Have you will and way. I seek no glory of my own. I seek to lift up Jesus today. I pray that you'd put the guard of God over these lips. Helps us to say nothing contrary to your will or your word. We're going to thank you. We're going to praise you for what's done in this meeting today. For we ask in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Hear all this familiar passage again. Elijah is one of the heroes. Moses is a great hero of mine, and certainly Elijah is too. And we've looked at a couple uh, times already in the first uh, verses of chapter number 17. If you'll remember in the very first verse, you'll find where God sent a Elijah to wicked King Ahab to tell him that there wasn't going to be any rain, uh, because, and basically it was because of his sin. Right after God told him to do that, he told him to go hide himself by the brook of Cherith. Now keep in mind too, the Lord sent him down to this brook during a drought. There wasn't going to be any rain, there wasn't going to be any dew during this time because it was a direct judgment from God. But here in the place, I like to call it the, I guess it would be the, the brook college. There Elijah learned some things about the Lord. The Lord told him before he ever got there, he said, look, you're going to drink by the brook. He said, I've already commanded the ravens even before he even got there. I've commanded them to feed you. So sure enough, Elijah went down there. Don't know exactly how long he was there, but he was there until that brook uh, dried up and sure enough just as God had told him he drunk, he drunk of that brook and the ravens came by in the morning and in the evening and fed him and I'm thankful that Elijah got educated on that day right after that you'll find uh, where he was summoned to go to Zarephath now again Zarephath if you go to chapter number 16 and verse number 31 you'll find that Ethbaal the king of the Zidonians Zarephath was a place where the Z Zidonians were now Ethbaal was Jezebel's dad she was wicked and they worshipped Baal this was a center this was a headquarters for Baal worship now Elijah didn't question God why you want me to go down here he just simply went where God told him to go up to this point he moved when God said move and he stayed when God said stay and boy that's important for you and I too again I say this all the time but we'd be better off in Africa in the will of God than in Yakin County out of the will of God it's important to listen to the still small voice of God and to move when he says move, and to stay when he says stay. But there, there was a problem. The bear, she had a small cruise of oil. Just a little bit of oil left. She had two sticks she was going in to gather. And she said, listen, I'm going to go in and fix what I've got. Then we're going to die. But God educated him about the empty barrel as well because you'll find where they trusted the Lord and the Bible said that, that cruise of oil didn't fail, neither did that barrel waste at all. God said what he, or he done what he said he was going to do and here he's learned a greater dependence upon the Lord. But here in these verses that we've just read, and keep in mind, if you come back tonight, I think one of my, one of my favorite passages is chapter number 18. If the Lord don't change our mind, that's where we'll be tonight when God sent fire come down from heaven but before Elijah could get to that place he's already learned something about God at the brook he's learned something about God in this house already about that cruise of oil and about the barrel that didn't fail and it didn't waste but here he's getting ready to get educated that listen God was the God of the living and not the dead if I could preach to you on a thought it would be on this statement there's one greater than the problem there is one that is greater than the problem. You say, preacher, what was the problem here? We'll look at verse 17. 
The Bible said there, and it came to pass after these things. What things? After the brook of Cherith, and after he's been there, and he's seen the, the cruise of oil, and the meal, it didn't waste, and it didn't fail. After these things, it, it said it came to pass after these things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Here is this child of this woman that has trusted God, that God has commanded to sustain Elijah. Here everything she's worked for, probably everything she's lived for. She loves this child, and now she finds this child is dead. You know what I'm reminded? Again, a lot of folks say, well, listen, folks, you just come to Christ, and you have a right relationship with God, and all your problems go away. Listen, that ain't the case. Elijah dealt with at the brook, he dealt with some trials, he dealt with some trials here. And this woman, again, she's trusted God, but here the problem is her son has died. Now here you think about this just a moment. Now I don't know what your problem is, but I know she had this great problem. And death, and boy, we've been affected by that the last little bit, seemed like. And we've experienced a lot of death, and that's something that's on our trail. I'm reminded as David, as he, as he was running from Absalom, he said, listen, there's just one step between me and death. And that's how close we are uh, from now to going into eternity. Now I don't know when you're going to leave this world. I don't know when I'm going to leave this world, but I do know this. Let me just go ahead and park right here just a moment. You need to prepare to meet God before you leave this world and the only way to prepare to meet God is to know Jesus Christ in a personal way if you come in here this morning if I were to ask you do you know without a doubt you're going to heaven it better not be I hope so maybe so I, I'm just not sure you can know if there's been a time when you've trusted Jesus Christ hallelujah to God put it down declare it man I'm telling you you can go to heaven if you know him because he's the only one that's able to allow us to go in to the presence of God but you need to prepare to meet him. But the problem was this son, this, this man or this young child has died and that was the problem. Now you may be here this morning you say, Preacher, that's not my issue today. Well listen, I, again, I'm convinced of this. You remember that woman with the issue of blood? Had the infirmity 12 years. Just like she had issues, I believe every person sitting in here, we all have issues. If you don't have issues, you just hold on, and there'll be some your way. You might not need this message today. You just better put it up on the shelf somewhere, put it on credit. We put everything else on credit, because there's going to come a time when you're going to have a problem. You're going to say, Preacher, what in the world can I do? And I'm here to remind you this morning, God wanted to send me by just to let you know that there is one that's greater than whatever problem you'll ever face in life. We find the problem, this young child has died. But notice verse 18. Notice the perception of this woman. And a lot of folks think the same thing. Look, her son's died. Look at verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou coming to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? This woman perceived that she was being judged because of her sin, her child had died. Now let me go ahead and tell you, there is correcting trials. You go to the Bible there in the book of Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, it said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Sometimes the harvest comes in and there's trials that we bring upon ourselves. But that's not the case here. You'll find here that I believe there's not only a correcting trial, but there's something that's called a perfecting trial. God sends us through the fire, so to speak, to mold us and to make us not into what we want to be, but into what God wants us to be. But she perceived that man, and I believe her conscience bear witness, I, they didn't say specifically what her sin was, but she thought it was a direct judgment from God. You remember in John chapter 9, you remember that blind man in verse number 1, it said that Jesus passed by a blind man which was, a born, or which was blind from his birth. You remember what the disciples asked Jesus in verse number 2 of John chapter 9? They said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now there's a lot of times we can't look and, and because things happen, sometimes it's just the will of God. It's not a corrective measure. It's a perfecting measure. It's a trial that God sends so we'll learn a greater dependence upon Him. And that's exactly what God is doing here. He's getting ready to show them that there's one greater than the problem. We find the problem. We find perception. I want you to notice the peace in verse 19. Look at what it said. Now here she's... She's, she's found out her son's dead. She's holding him. 
And now she goes to Elijah and tells him, you know why you're going to bring this sin to remembrance of me? And look at verse 19. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Now you would think if a child has died, you, we would be frantic or we'd be in a hurry. But notice how calm and collected Elijah was. Read it again. Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. We find the peace of Elijah. Now, you've got to remember, Elijah's already witnessed what God can do. I mean, somebody, if somebody told him, Elijah, you know what? These birds are going to feed you one day. He'd probably say, man, you're crazy. But he's experienced that. He's been down there at the brook of Cherith, and listen, God supplied his need, and then he come where this woman didn't have hardly nothing, just a handful of meal and a little bit of cruise, and he'd seen God multiply that and bless that and sustain them and provide for them, and now in this little place he's experienced that problem, but he knows that there's one greater than the problem at hand. And we find here that the peace of him just taking him up up in, but there's something else that I've seen in this text, and don't miss this. It said that he said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom. You know what she was doing? She had, got to, she had done everything she could do. It was out of her hands. It was impossible for her. She could not bring life back into it. But what she did, she handed that burden off to somebody else that could. That could do the impossible. One that was greater than the problem that she had. She experienced and she demonstrated faith by giving that child unto Elijah. And I want you to notice verse number 20. You'll find the prayer. I'm going to tell you, if there's something about Elijah, Elijah was a praying man. Again, up to this point, now he's basically just watched God do it all. I mean, God sustained him by the brook. He, God's the one that sent the ravens by. Then God's the one that supplied the meal. But now he's got to personally get involved into the work of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you personally involved in the work of God? That's a good question to ask. Because again, all of us, why are we here? I think there's three fundamental questions I've given to you before. And I'm sure I ain't going by the notes. But this is where the Lord's sort of directing us. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Where do we come from? I share this with you all the time. Those that like to have the big, big eyes and little U's look down on people, let me tell you, all of us come from dirt. So we ain't got nothing to boast about or brag about. That's where we come from. And listen, God breathed into the, the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul. Well, why are we here? God's got a purpose. Listen, we're, we're here to be a light, the Bible said, to be salt to the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 tells us that. If you got a steak, if you got greens, and, and man, listen, I love creases, I love uh, uh, collards and, and turnip greens and all those things, but man, you're going to have to put some salt on them. They need some fat back grease and some salt. That stuff will clog your arteries, but I, I'll tell you right now, it's good, amen. But it's got to have salt on it to season it. Well, what in the world do you put on salt that ain't salty? Ain't a thing you can do but throw it out. You know what our purpose is down here? We're to have an influence on this lost and dying world. That's why we're here. God left us here and you say, Preacher, I just don't know what I think my job's done. Listen, if your job is done, you'd have done been home, amen. You still got breath, and God wants to use you. Where do we come from? We come from the dust of the ground. Why are we here? We're to be the salt of the earth. We're to be the light of the world. Well, where are we going? Well, that based, that's not based on something, but it's based on someone. And that's Jesus Christ. Where are you going? If you're saved by the grace of God, listen, one of these days you're going to leave this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 8 tells us to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. One of these days when I close these eyes in death, I'm going to be with my Savior. Not on what Brian did, not on what somebody else did, but on what Jesus did on the cross. And again, those three questions, why, where do we come from? Why are we here? And where am I going? 
If you don't know Christ as your Savior, friend, you better listen up. You better quit messing around. You better quit playing games with God and say, i got plenty of time. Don't you fool yourself because you might leave this world today or next week or Jesus Christ could come again. He ain't changed his mind. He's still coming. But if you die in your sin and you reject the free offer of salvation, friend, I'm telling you, there is a place called hell. It's just as sure as I'm standing in East Bend, North Carolina here in September of 2013. There's a place called hell. And if you die in your sin, that's exactly where you'll go. But there's no excuse for you to go there if you listen to the call of God. God said, hey, I'll save you. I'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. It don't matter where you've been. don't matter where you're going. Praise God. I'm glad that the Lord can save you today and He can meet your need. Quit saying no thank you to the cross of Calvary. Just finally surrender all. Raise the white flag of surrender and run to the altar and give your heart and life to Jesus. And friend, I promise you, you'll say, man, if I knew it was this good, I'd have done it a long time ago. Just get saved. All that was just extra this morning. But I want you to know something. When you look at this text here, oh, Elijah was a man of prayer. The Bible said in verse number 20, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Over here in the book of James, I want to read this to you. You can just mark this down. But in James chapter 5, to give you the whole context of this, I'm going to begin reading verse 13. It said, Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Again, if those sins are going to be forgiven, he's going to have to ask for it. Verse 16 said, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. Why did God tell us to confess our faults one to another? That's just like a lot of folks can. We don't always air out all the things we've got or wear on our lapel what our problem is. But you know what? It's, it's something special when you can call a dear saint of God and say, Listen, I've got this issue in my life. I've got this need, and they can pray specifically for you. That's what God tells us to do. Don't ever take that for granted. Then the Bible went on to say, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now here it is, verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You see, he's praying. He's praying unto the Lord. But there's something else that I've seen in that text that I want to show to you. 1 Kings chapter 17. Again, I want you to notice verse 21. Now here he's prayed. And this is something, before I even get to verse 21, think about this for just a moment. There's things in our life, we have problems, we have issues, we want to see God move in, and there's things that's beyond our control that, that are impossible, humanly speaking. But with God, all things are possible. God's able to move in, but it's our responsibility to pray. And again, that's the channel of communication the Lord has told us to do that. We've got to communicate with Him to have a right fellowship with Him. And Elijah, he's got a hold of God. But I want you to notice verse 21. Now just take this as a grain of salt, but I've seen something very, uh, that really, really spoke to me in verse 21. Notice what he did. He prayed, and then he said in verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Now this child is dead. He's carried him upstairs where he's staying, laying him on his bed, and now he lays on top of him. Notice that Elijah initiated the touch on the dead. Now just follow me. And then he interceded on behalf of the child. He prayed unto God. He said, oh God, let this soul come back in this child again. You know what I see a great picture of? I see a great picture of salvation. You say, how's that, preacher? Well, God the Holy Ghost initiates in us. And listen, the Bible said that and you who were dead in, in trespasses and sins hath he quickened. He's made alive in Christ Jesus. Every person that's not saved or before we get saved, the Bible said that we're dead spiritually. 
And we're so alienated from God, God's got to initiate again the call on our life. And I see the Spirit working through the work of the work uh, through the work of the Word of God. Because the Bible said in Romans 10, verse 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God initiates on us, and He lets us know through the Word of God that, that we're sinners and we're lost and we need a Savior. And then when we reach out to Him, what does He do? He intercedes on our behalf. You say, how do you know? Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. The Bible said this, Wherefore, and this is speaking of Jesus, Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost, and that's completely, that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth, to make intercession for them. Why in the world does the Bible say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Friend, if you, if you don't pray in Jesus' name, you might as well not even pray at all. That's right. When you pray, if you don't pray to to Jesus, listen, the Scripture tells us to do that. He is there. Listen, he, He suffered on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. Where is He at today? Listen, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. We've got an advocate that's a lawyer on our behalf that constantly pleads before the Father. And listen, I'm reminded of a verse while I'm even preaching this over there in the book of the Revelation where the devil, the accuser of the brethren, night and day stand before God accusing us and saying, Boy, look at Brian. He's a dirty, rotten sinner. Oh, look at all these that have put saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all sinners. And boy, that's when Jesus turns around and said, Listen, he's my child. She's my child. They've been forgiven. Hallelujah. I'm going up there one day because of what he did. I'm glad that he's a mediator. He's an intercessor. But boy, I see the great picture of God initiating salvation and then interceding on our behalf. Notice verse 22. We find the power. What happened, preacher? And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Folks, only God can do that. Only God can do that. Listen, God used Elijah. Elijah was an instrument, but God was the one that sent the life down. You see, there was one that was greater than the problem that they were facing. Notice the proof in verse 23. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. You know what Elijah is basically saying? Listen, I realize, and I don't know the lady's name, but she was the widow woman at Zarephath. Here she is in the headquarters of Baal. Baal worship's going on all around them. Everybody else is serving Baal. Well, listen, Baal's impotent. He couldn't help in a situation like this. And Elijah has come in and he's penetrating this old, cold, dark area, the headquarters of Baal's worship. Here Satan's headquarters is set up right here in this town and only God could do what just happened. And the proof was, was a transformed life. <laughs> you say, preacher, what's that got to do with that? You know what the greatest proof that there's a God in heaven today is? It's not. And listen, I'm thankful for the sun. I realize when the sun comes up, that's a great picture that there's a God and there's a creator. Man, you go down to the oceans and you see the waves crashing in and they only come so far. Why is that? Because God has put a, a boundary there. And he said, listen, you're coming this far and you ain't coming no further. He allows that moon to come up at night and the stars and man, he sends the rain and the wind that was blowing yesterday all the things we have yes that's a picture even the firmaments declare the glory of God but I'm going to tell you the greatest evidence that there's a God in heaven is when an old dirty rotten sinner realizes that they're lost and undone without God and they turn to Christ and man he takes that old bottle out of the drunkard he takes that needle away from the drug addict and man I'm telling you that old adulterer he changes that heart and man transforms them into a new creature I'm telling you the greatest evidence of God in this world today is a transformed life. That's the proof that He's alive. Say, preacher, how do you know how He changed my life? You're saved. He changed yours. Notice this last thing, verse 24. The woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. There was a purpose behind all of this. Again, remember, Elijah's in the heartland of Baal worship. God proved to Elijah, not only Elijah, but this woman, not only the woman, but that child, that there was one that was greater than the problem they were facing. You know what I look and I see 
Death was that problem. I don't know what your greatest problem is. I know this. It might be a sin problem today, and you say, Preacher, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Well, listen, there's one greater than the problem. His name's Jesus. You might be here today, and you say, Preacher, I'm struggling financially. I'm, tr- I'm struggling physically. I'm struggling with a relationship issue. I'm struggling here or there, and I may not even name it, but maybe the Lord's already revealed to you that there's a problem in your life. Well, listen, folks, all I can tell you is this. There's one that's greater than the problem. His name ain't Brian. His name ain't Harold or Brother Leroy. But his name's Jesus. And he's able to help you today. The same God that helped Elijah with that problem, folks, he's still greater than the problem today. As we stand to our feet all over the house of Sister Linda comes, let's pray. Father, I love you, and I say thank you for the privilege to preach your word. And God, I've done my very best to deliver the message of the hour. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, you've sent me sort of a little bit of a different direction today on some things. If there's one here that's lost in this assembly, God, I pray for Holy Ghost conviction, God, to move, remove every hindrance and distraction. God, I realize all the forces of hell will be upon us right now to try to keep folks in their seat. But God, I pray that the Holy Ghost of God would have liberty and reign, Lord, to move in and out of these pews. If there's one here today that's never been saved, God, would you help them to walk the aisle, give their heart and life to Jesus, Lord, help them to realize there's one greater than their sin problem. I pray for that one that came in here today that's so discouraged and so beat up and just needs that comfort. God, I pray that you'd help them to see that there's one greater than the problem that they're facing today. God, I cannot help them. I realize Elijah couldn't help that woman or that child, but God, through you, I'm glad that you can do all things. And I pray that you'd move in this invitation time, have your will and way, and God, we're going to give you thanks for what's accomplished and done. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There's folks already coming to this altar. If you're here today and you've never been saved, I invite you to come right now. Listen, I'll be quiet. You can take me by the hand and, boy, it'd be an honor just to lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know you amongst friends. There's one greater than your problem. How about it, saying to God, you might be here today. Preacher, boy, I'm struggling. Struggling. Listen, there's one greater than your problem. Hello, friends. This is Brian Pondexter, the pastor of Faith Community Baptist Church, located at 2216 Hennings Road in East Bend, North Carolina. We're so grateful to have you listening to our CD ministry that's been provided as an outreach of our church. It's our desire and focus at Faith Community Baptist Church to preach and teach the whole counsel of God to a lost and dying world, to equip the saints of God for service, and to encourage the elderly and shut-ins who cannot attend services due to physical ailments. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for Sunday school for all ages, and our Sunday school hour is followed by our worship service at 11 a.m. with old-fashioned singing and preaching from the Word of God. We meet back every Sunday night at 6 p.m. for our worship service. And every second Sunday night of each month, we have what's called an eat and meet service. After our 6 p.m. service, we gather in the fellowship hall for food and fellowship. On Wednesdays, we meet back at the church for our midweek worship service with choir singing and preaching again from God's holy word. Our ladies prepare a meal each Wednesday prior to our service from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. I give you and your family a cordial invitation to be with us at any or all of our service times. Above all, you may be listening today, and maybe you've never made a personal commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, that's the greatest decision anyone can ever make in this life. Too many folks prepare for vacation. They prepare for retirement. They seem to prepare for everything, but sad to say, many make no preparations for eternity. The reality is very clear. We all will leave this world someday, for the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You must understand that you are guilty before a holy God. Romans 3.23 said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You must understand that your good words, good works and good deeds will not get you to heaven. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. 
and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible said, Therefore by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You must understand that you're loved. I'm thankful that in John 3 and verse 16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5 and verse 8 declares, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You must understand and realize there's only one way to stand right before God. There's not many ways, there's only one. Jesus said in John 14 and verse number 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the apostles' message was very simple. There in Acts chapter 4, in verse number 12, they said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You might ask the question, Preacher, how can I be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. He asked Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Romans 10, 9 said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You must ask God to save you. I can't do it. No one can do it for you. Romans 10, 13 said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you know you're a sinner, and if you're sorry for your sin, and you believe Jesus died for your sins, you simply have to ask him to save you. You might say, Preacher, how can I know for sure God will hear me? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us that we must be drawn. John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which had sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Psalm 51 and verse 17 gives us the attitude we need to have when we come to God. It said there, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. If God draws you by conviction, and if you're sorry for your sin, you repent of them, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, and if you asked him to save you, then the Bible declares you've been saved. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you've been forgiven of all your sin. For Romans 8, 1 declares, There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Once a person has been saved, they need to be a part of a fundamental Bible-believing church where they can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God calls us out of darkness and commands us to walk in light after we've been saved by His marvelous grace. If we can help you here at Faith Community Baptist Church in any way, feel free to contact us. If you have asked God to save you, please contact us, and we will send you some free literature to help you in your newfound life in Christ. Thank you again for listening to our CD ministry that's been provided by our church here, and may God richly bless you and your family is our prayer.